So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event. We really appreciate you coming and sharing your evening with us. We would love to know where you're dialing in from this evening. So if you wouldn't mind uh, considering sharing, answering the poll that I've just uh, launched, it would be lovely to know where you're dialing in from, because it means that we have the opportunity to understand a bit about who has come in the audience and to be able to understand a bit about where some of your perspectives and opinions might be coming from. So my name is Amanda Strengths. I'm the Patient and Public Involvement Lead at Cambridge University Hospitals and the NIHR Cambridge Biomedical Research Centre. In my role, I'm really fortunate to be able to join lots of events like this one, to share our research with members of the public and to make the most of the expertise and experiences that you can bring to our research. As many of you may know, research using health data is becoming more, uh, is becoming more common both in Cambridge and across the NHS and research organisations more widely. Many researchers and healthcare professionals are excited about the potential of health data for answering really important health questions that cannot easily or quickly be answered any other way. But data ultimately comes from, from you, from patients and members of the public, and we really want you to have the opportunity to be part of deciding how this uh, way of doing research develops. And we also want researchers and healthcare staff to have as many opportunities as possible to talk to their patients, to members of the public and to other people working in research about how research using health data is done. Now, tonight's event is hosted by the Data and AI Research Governance Team at CUH. And over the course of the evening, I'm going to be joined by three speakers with expertise in this area. And then we're going to finish the session with a live Q&A session. So if you keep an eye or if you have a look at the bottom of your screen, sorry, you'll see that there's a little Q&A box and we would invite you to submit your questions as we go along. And then I will try and answer them or I'll try and have our panelists answer because heavens only knows my expertise is not this area uh, at the end. Um, many of you were kind enough to send us some questions before we got started. Um, which means that I already have some questions to go with. So if I don't manage to get through all of the questions, please don't panic. Um, we'll try and answer as many as we can. So the speakers that I'm joined with uh, by tonight, and they'll uh, introduce themselves later when they come on to share their slides, but I'll be joined first by, or hopefully first by Dr. Adam Loveday, the Data and AI Research Governance Lead at Cambridge University Hospitals. And then later we will be joined by Dr. Ari Eckhol, the Chief Clinical Information Officer and Consultant in Anesthesia and Intensive Care at CUH, sorry, at Cambridge University Hospitals. And then later still by Dr. Raj Jenna, a consultant oncologist at Cambridge University Hospitals, who has been working with patients to create tools um, for improving cancer diagnosis, and then once we've heard from our three speakers, we will be joined for the Q&A by Andy Bush. And Andy Bush is one of our public members who has extensive experience as a patient at public involvement member reviewing research at Cambridge, Cambridge University Hospitals Foundation Trust. Now, hopefully my first speaker is able to join us. Adam, are you able to join us to share your slides? Yes, I can with about five seconds to spare. Fantastic. Better late than never, that's what I always say. Absolutely. Yep, ironically had some IT problems. So <laughs> let me see if I can share my screen. Um... The wonders of IT and Zoom. Absolutely. <laughs> um... Just while Adam finds his slides, if you all would like to know where everyone is dialing in from, you can see that we've got actually quite an even split. So we've got almost a quarter or just over a quarter of people from Cambridge, another quarter from Cambridge Shear, and then the sort of remaining half from slightly further afield. So... Can you find them, Adam? Because I do have your slides just here. If we want to practice our best, Adam, uh, what's his name, Mr. Witty um, impression of next slide, please. Uh, we could absolutely do a Chris Witty if that works, please. I cannot see my slides, which yeah. I'm very sorry about that. Okay, no panic. Here we go. Um... How's that? Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so, welcome to the workshop. Uh, I trust Amanda welcomed you warmly, but I didn't actually see it myself. So many thanks for attending the workshop. Um, so my name is Adam. I am the Data and AI Research Governance Lead at Cambridge University Hospitals. So 
Cambridge University Hospitals uh, is based on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Uh, so we've got Cambridge University Hospitals at Papworth, the University of Cambridge, uh, and the clinical school and various other institutions. So we have quite a big research ecosystem across the campus. And CUH includes Addenbrooke's Hospital and the Rosie Maternity Hospital, as well as some new buildings that are sort of coming on stream, such as the Cambridge Cancer Research Hospital. Uh, and I work in the research and development department and I kind of look at the governance of projects that are using data from the hospitals. So what I really wanted to do with this presentation is kind of set the scene at CUH and for this workshop uh, before, before handing over to Ari and Raj who are going to walk through some of the exciting work that's going on in this area. And a lot of what I'll talk about and a lot of what you'll hear in the workshop is really a kind of accumulated body of work over the last four years, um, including a lot of the sort of heavy lifting that my predecessor in this role uh, was able to do as well. So just want to be clear that I haven't actually done everything that I'm going to talk about. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Amanda? So as I said, CUH is Addenbrooke's Hospital and the Rosie currently. Um, we're quite a big hospital and we're very research active. So there are about 20,000 people on the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. About 5,000 of those are employed in research functions. Uh, at CUH, at any one time, we have something like 1,000 active studies across all different study types and something like 300 studies that are in setup at any one time. Um, we have about 24,000 people that take part in research every year. And you can see some of the other figures over there as well. And a part of this kind of overall research portfolio will be data studies. So this will be research that is using data collected at the hospital in the kind of hospital's normal business of caring for patients and that will see medical records at the hospital. Um, and can I have the next slide, please, Amanda? And just as part of its kind of day job of caring for patients, the NHS produces a lot of data. So on the left, you can see the types of data that might include. So this would be things like emergency room visits, um, medications, imaging, laboratory results, uh, primary care, so that might be GPs, uh, just essentially everything that happens to you whilst you're in the care of the NHS. And on the right, you can see in 2020, that was the equivalent of about 4.6 billion typical laptop computers. So the NHS produced an equivalent amount of data to 4.6 billion laptop storage capacity. Um, and when this data is collected as part of normal care, when we come to a research context, that data can be extracted, anonymized, and then used in research. And if I could have the next slide, please, Amanda. Sorry, this one's got some animation, so you might have to do a bit of clicking. Um, so the types of research that my team and I might, re might review when researchers come to us and want to do some research using that data, it could be everything from a clinician like Raj or Ari wanting to analyze some outcomes in a few hundred of their own patients through to say university researchers wanting a fairly large data set so that they can do some large population work. It might run through to things like natural language processing of free text data. It might look at images and some work on image segmentation for, for example, radiotherapy treatment that Raj might talk about. Uh, or it might include things like training and evaluating artificial intelligence models. So we really run the whole kind of spectrum of research. And for my team and I, when we're reviewing those projects, there's a kind of increasing scale of complexity that we have to kind of wrestle with. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Amanda. So when we're reviewing these projects, we look at a variety of things. So on the left, it would be kind of data protection law and the common law duty of confidentiality. So this would be the kind of legal framework that the research would operate within. But then almost on top of that, there's a regulatory and an ethics layer. So something may be legal, but that may not necessarily mean it's ethical. 
and then always on top of that again there is a patient expectations layer so it may be legal it may be ethical but do patients expect their data to be used in that way um and so that's the kind of things that we would review when we we're getting applications from researchers and if i could have the next slide again Amanda, please and what we also have is because of the nature of the area so it's very technology focused uh, it's very fast moving and so whilst we're wrestling with those things for uh, research applications we also have a kind of change in context that we work within and so on the left here is examples of various things that might be changing so it could be policy so uh, at the top was a review that was uh, published by uh, the department of health and social care into how the nhs can make better use of data for research so it was published in april last year uh, on the left is then the data saves lives strategy which took that review and tried to make policy recommendations and a big part of that was then moving into secure data environments which we can talk about in a bit later and so really the only constant in this area is change so when my team and i are getting applications we're reviewing these applications in an uncertain context so if i could have the next slide please amanda so what we wanted to do was to take that kind of complex governance framework that changing environment and really place more structure around it so what we have established is called erin which is an acronym for the electronic health record research and innovation database so this is a record so it's an nhs ethics approved uh, research database um erin is not a kind of physical database so we're not sort of physically storing data separately to how it's normally stored erin is really an umbrella over the systems that make up an electronic hospital record so on the left that would be epic which is our main patient record at cuh um, which is where most of our data will be stored it includes things like medications treatments diagnoses and so on uh, pax is an imaging system so when you have an mri scan for example that will be in pax we also have labs that use a system for monitoring where samples are stored and who has access to them and various other kind of systems at the trust that collectively make up an electronic patient record and Erin is really an umbrella over these and what it allows us to do is review applications from researchers who want to access data that is stored in these systems extract it take off identifiers so that patients are no longer identifiable and make that available to researchers subject to a process that I will get into on the next slide please Amanda so the main advantage that we have of establishing Erin is that we don't as part of Erin we have uh, NHS ethics approval as a database and that means that when researchers want to do research through that database we can then approve that through the database structure rather than those individual researchers having to get their own separate approvals so it streamlines the process for researchers uh, and also means that we can then review their applications um, and ensure that they are using data in, a, in, a, in, in, an, in an appropriate way so i'll get more into the detail here but essentially a researcher would apply for access it would be reviewed by two committees which i will come on to uh, and then if it's approved that data will be extracted and de-identified and provided to them in an environment that has been agreed through those two committees um, so if i can have the next slide please amanda so what we have so the first committee is the erin data access committee so i chair this committee which meets every month uh, it includes senior uh, staff from the hospital so we have the chief clinical information officer our information governance lead and data protection officer uh, the, some staff from R&D including our R&D manager and we also have some patient representatives which would be Andy that you will hear from later and we review applications against the five saves criteria which is on the right hand side so this is a very widely used criteria for data access so it's used by the office of national statistics and others 
and we review applications against those criteria. But what we are also setting up, uh, if I can have the next slide, please, Amanda, is a patient involvement panel. So what I would really want to kind of leave you with from my very brief context setting is what we would really like from this workshop is for patients to come and get involved in reviewing applications for access to data for the reason that we must ensure that data are used in a way that patients are comfortable with and aware of. So our patient panel will have the opportunity to review all applications. Um, it will meet once a month and feed into our data access committee. What I don't want to do is kind of presuppose how that committee, how that patient panel, uh, the detail of how it may want to work. So for example, what I would hope is that members of the patient panel will feed into our data access committee. But in terms of numbers and how, that's something we want to decide in conjunction with the patient panel. And what we would also kind of expect potentially is that, uh, if I could have the next slide, please, Amanda. So alongside reviewing kind of individual researcher applications, what we also want is, uh, I guess, kind of more systems level feedback as well. So there might be patterns, for example, that emerge across applications. And what we can then do is kind of feed that back into our governance processes so that we're addressing them uh, sort of upstream rather than downstream once we actually get an application. And so we want you to kind of be part of a virtuous circle that kind of continually improves our governance processes as well as reviewing individual applications. Uh, and then if I can have my last slide, Amanda, please. So we'll provide this information at the end of the webinar as well. Um, but I just want you to kind of keep in mind as you hear the discussion and the other presenters that if you do want to be involved in that, we would love you, absolutely love you to be involved. Um, you can email us at that email address that will be up at the end of the webinar as well. And then we can provide more information and kind of decide on the best way forward to set up that panel and work out the logistics. And yeah, but I would just like to thank you for joining and I look forward to hearing the next two presenters as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Anne. That was a really interesting and a great way to start off that evening. But our second speaker for this evening, who has absolutely uh, proceeded and guessed whose turn it was, uh, is Dr. Ari Eckhol, who is going to tell us more about his work using health data for research. So over to you, Ari. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, and just to say, I think this is an incredibly exciting um, event. I genuinely think this is an incredibly exciting event. Um, I hope this will mark a, a real start to a, a dialogue and communication and getting public involvement in the sorts of things that we can do. Because I think that the, 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 the potential for some of the, the, the wealth of data that we're sitting on at, at CUH and, and, and in, you know, in the NHS generally is, is enormous for the betterment of society and betterment of people. Uh, but it's really important that we do this in, a, in, a, in an acceptable way. Um, so um, as advertised, uh, I actually split my, my, um, my work. Um, some of the time I'm a consultant in uh, neuroscience and intensive care medicine. I deal with um, some of the most severely um, severe cases of brain trauma and trauma. Um, and the other part of my time I spend as a chief clinical information officer for, for the hospital as well. So there I'm interested in how our clinical staff use data in the, in the clinical uh, domain. Uh, and also how we keep data safe and how we, how, we, how we make best use of that. So that's my background. Um, I'm going to give you some examples um, to try and illustrate the benefits of, potential benefits of health data research. And I'm giving you examples from uh, neuroscience and from intensive care. And the reason from that um, is that, well, these happen to be in my area and I, I sort of hopefully know a bit about them and can speak knowledgeably about them. And not all of these examples are actually even going to be from Erin or, or even CUH. But I've chosen them to hopefully um, highlight some really important aspects, specific aspects uh, regarding things like consent, op the trade off between opt out and bias, privacy and so on. But the, the lessons from the examples I'm going to show are completely general and apply to some extent absolutely everywhere. So I hope that they will be of, of interest. I have sort of liberally laced the, the talk with some QR codes here and there to some of the publications that may or may not be of interest. So if you if you have your your phone handy if you've got a smartphone and want to point it at the QR codes that will take you straight to some of these publications. Okay without further ado um, just a little bit about intensive care. Um, the thing about, that's special about intensive care I think compared to many areas of the hospital is we generate an awful lot of data. We monitor patients 
very, very, very closely because our patients are at very high risk of deterioration. Uh, we have data feeds from all the machines that are keeping patients alive and supporting patients. And we're also, um, although I'm not going to be talking about imaging research in this talk, we're also quite uh, avid consumers of, of medical imaging data as well. So we generate a huge amount of data. The other thing that's quite interesting, I think, about ICU patients is the first thing is they're often unconscious or semi-conscious. And that raises question of questions about, is it actually possible to, how, how would one get consent from these people who, who are unconscious? Um, and that's, that's often not possible until after the fact. Um, the other thing is that um, the, the group is very heterogeneous. Um, so we have a lot of different kinds of patients. I'll come back to that in, in just a moment. And the last thing, which again touches on the idea of consent or the problems with consent, is we have a really high mortality. And indeed, I, in my area of intensive care, we often have a lot of patients, uh, a reasonable number of patients, who never fully regain consciousness. So how would one gain consent from those patients even after the fact? Um, and that's really impossible. And if you think about what would happen if we had to gain consent and use uh, data on a consent basis, then we would have a very biased population. We would necessarily only have those survivors, um, those patients who recovered to a, a sufficient degree that they could um, then subsequently give con consent. The heterogeneity of the patients, the fact that all the patients are really, really different in terms of the diseases they come with, the treatments that they've had before they land on intensive care, means that there's a lot of variability. And so intensive care trials are really, really difficult. They need typically very, very large numbers to actually show the sorts of results that we hope, hope to find. Um, the other thing, and I think this is particularly the case, particularly interesting or well demonstrated by neuroscience and neurotrauma, is that um, neurotrauma, like other, some other areas of medicines, um, can make med headlines. Okay, so here is a, this is public domain, of course. Uh, big accidents are relative, such as this are relatively rare. And, and so um, this particular individual obviously was not in, admitted to Cambridge University hospitals. But if I was proposing to share data from the particular hospital that he was admitted to, then it wouldn't take very much with knowledge that's already in the public domain through newspapers to put two and two together and actually realise that actually this person of a certain age in this particular hospital uh, admitted for a, a brain injury is probably this person. And that's really the problem that we, we face in trying to de-identify and anonymize data. And it's particularly um, uh, pressing in, in this kind of area. So we have to handle the privacy aspects of data, the re-identification aspects of data very, very, very carefully. Another thing that's interesting about ICU is that the idea of data sharing and making it available for research is not new. So uh, there are two very large databases in the, in the US, the MIMIC database, which is now on its um, on its fourth iteration, which contains about 50 data from about 50,000 patients that have been de-identified, uh, and then a related collaboration, the EICU, which contains a slightly smaller data set, but from much more, many more patients, 200, uh, 201,000 patients, have been available in the US um, and actually made it internationally available for many, many years now. And if you do a search in PubMed and look for papers that have made use of these uh, data sets for uh, medical research, you'll see quite a lot of results down at the bottom. On top of that, these data sets are so rich that actually they've really been used by AI and machine learning and statistical researchers to hone some of their methodologies as well. This hasn't just been about actually improving our understanding of medicine and these patients, but also using this data to improve methodologies that can then be reapplied to bigger data sets um, or other kinds of data sets. So this has been around for some time and extremely effective. The laws surrounding privacy in the US are somewhat different to, um, to the EU. So we've been perhaps a little bit behind the curve on this, but I want to draw your attention to two um, data sets that have become available in the EU. Um, the one on the left, which is the uh, data set from uh, Amsterdam UMC, which we released uh, some years ago now. This is a, a de-identified data set that is uh, released to, to uh, researchers on a um, for a named project basis contains about 22,000 patients worth of ICU records and this was one of the data sets where we actually if you, if you want to have a look at the paper we, we went to a lot of care over how we de-identified this it's quite possible to mathematically work out or estimate at least the risk of re-identification um, for different kinds of groups of, uh, of people so and it's important to realize again this is context sensitive so if I were, if it was a member of the public or a typical researcher that was using this data set, then they might have access, as I showed earlier, to 
things that are in the newspapers, in the media, on the internet. Uh, and that might be something we need to think about the risk of the re-identification from. If this data, for example, were to be used by, uh, I'm not saying it would be, but if it were used by an, in, an insurance company, for example, then actually the insurance company has many other kinds of uh, data available to it. So now the risk of re-identification is much higher. So we've calculated those risks and put it to public panels in, in, in the Netherlands and actually had a conversation, a dialogue about what is acceptable, what is, what are the risks and what are the benefits and, and what do people think is acceptable. Um, over on the right hand side, another um, smaller uh, data set, or a larger number of patients. This is actually the CC HIC. This is a UK data set um, and CUH has contributed to this along with another uh, nine intensive care units, the, the two intensive care units on uh, adult intensive care units, the CUH plus another nine. Um, and again, there's about 50,000 patients in there. If you have a look in these um, in these uh, papers, you'll get an idea of how we actually go about doing the de-identification, what that's involved, because it's quite a complicated thing to do. Now, I just want to think about uh, randomized control trials now, move away from big data. Uh, everyone will know about randomized control trial where you, you take some, pay, some uh, volunteers and you randomize them into a active treatment or a placebo. And these are regarded widely as the gold standard of what, whether something causes something else or whether something is associated with, a, um, with a, is, is an effective treatment. And the randomization means that other influences are kind of distributed between the two arms and, and don't matter anymore. But we actually don't have any real assurance of this. What we try and try and make sure that there aren't things we haven't thought of by having very, very tight inclusion criteria. So there's a question about whether a randomized control trial really applies to the actual um, healthcare pro, uh, uh, population that we're interested in. We choose the randomization strategy very carefully and we try and then check for balance of things that we think are important afterwards, but we can't check for balance of things we didn't think of in the first place. And the last thing to think about randomized control trials and also criticism is that sometimes they, like an ICU is a very good example, they need to be so big that they are simply either unaffordable or not feasible because they will take too many years to acquire the, the number of patients and then things will have changed. So in conclusion, randomized control trials, well, they're great, but they're far from perfect proof of, of anything really. On the other hand, we have observational data. This is data that is generated as a, as a byproduct of the routine care every single day of the week, uh, every day of the year, um, every year. This observation, such as electronic health record data, allows us to study not just in a tightly inclusioned randomized control trial, but what really happens in the real, in the real world. Now, in itself, looking at these things doesn't necessarily prove a causal link between something and something else that may happen together, but it might suggest a link. And this can still be sometimes useful. Even just looking at these large databases, this is uh, data from, from CUH. It's a simple, a really, this is as simple as it gets in terms of doing a registry study. We simply looked at patients who are presented with trauma and looked at whether they have on admission or after admission developed something called a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in the, in the lungs, which is common in trauma patients. Now, this is a very simple study, and actually these 2,746 trauma patients, this is the largest uh, observational cohort that's ever been published in this group. And what we have actually found in this group is in, we've not only worked out what the incidence of pulmonary embolisms is, but we've identified this group, this very large group of patients who actually are admitted or develop very, very early pulmonary embolisms. We've always thought of this as something that was preventable later on, but some of these patients are turning up at hospital with pulmonary embolisms. And that makes you think about new ways of treating these, these PEs, whether or not they really are the same thing as PEs that happen in patients who come off a long haul uh, flight or, or who have been sick in hospital for some time. This is as simple as it gets, but actually very, very informative and changes the way we think about the, the disease. We can use some of the data that, again, is just routinely collected to uncover aspects of care and social inequality. So here is some data, uh, a study that we did using uh, nearly 10,000 cardiac arrests um, in the east of England. Again, this was routinely collected data, uh, de-identified. Uh, and this are two things. One is it's the first real description of this entity of a traumatic cardiac arrest and how it's actually different from a medical cardiac arrest caused by a primary problem with the heart. But also quite interestingly, by digging into these kinds of data, we can demonstrate that the likelihood of receiving bystander cardiopulmonary resuscitation, so CPR at the scene, which is absolutely crucial for survival at discharge from hospital, was in fact largely determined by socioeconomic status. So we can uncover a social inequity uh, of healthcare and also allows us a target where we might think about um, prioritizing CPR training. 
all of this from a data set that otherwise would have just sat there and gone to waste, essentially, would never have been looked at again. So again, that's really simple things one can do with observational data. And as I said, this doesn't necessarily prove a causal link, but if you've got a big or rich enough data set, there will be somewhere within that data set, a digital lookalike to a patient that you're interested in. So in other words, you can find for each patient you're interested in another patient who is otherwise identical, but nevertheless, because of randomness, because we don't have we don't have don't have equipoise on um, uh, uh, as to what the right treatment is. We'll have received a different treatment for the same indication. And what that means is essentially such big data starts to create a sort of natural randomized controlled trial, provided that we capture all the features that you described as this twin, this lookalike. So actually, if you've got enough observational data, you can start to use it to demonstrate causality. And remember that randomized controlled trials, whilst they're regarded as the gold standard for, for cause, cause, causal inference, are not perfect, and they're sometimes just simply impossible to do. And ICU is a really good example of that. The overwhelming, and this is almost a, a matter of embarrassment, the overwhelming majority of intensive uh, care unit randomized controlled trials are negative. Okay, they are just simply never big enough to demonstrate a result because the patients are too heterogeneous. So the gold standard of, of, of of, of causal inference just really isn't very gold at all. So what can you do? So this is a, um, a study uh, looking at 19,515 patients from that CC-HIC data set that uh, I, I talked about earlier. This is a lot of patients. You would have to wait a very long time to get gather this many patients in a, random, in a randomized controlled trial. And what we were looking at here is whether or not the amount of oxygen that was delivered, if, if excess oxygen was delivered to these patients, was in some way harmful. And we found a signal that suggested that indeed, actually having too much oxygen, which one would think, well, oxygen is good for you, so surely a little bit more isn't a problem. Too much oxygen actually is harmful for you. This is a direct big data study. It didn't require recruiting any patients. It just came from, from the data that we were random, that we were acquiring on a day-to-day -day basis. Now contrast this, for example, with this randomized control study. This is the ICU ROTS um, study uh, from uh, 2020. This is a randomized control study looking at the same question, um, essentially. It, it, this required not 11, but 21 intensive care units. Australia was not big enough, so they had to use New Zealand as well. It took from 2000, end of 2015 to 2018 to conduct this study, so this was a very long time. In that time, only 965, well, I say only, that's an enormous achievement, but it, but it's much um, far, far fewer than we had in, in our database. It's not a perfect randomized control trial because it's unblinded. You can't hide how much oxygen people are getting from the clinician. So it's, it's a risk of bias. And it didn't really show any difference. And the authors concluded that, in fact, it just simply wasn't big enough to detect difference and now suggest that we should do a mega rock study for 40,000 patients. Now, this will be extremely expensive. And I don't know how feasible this really is. But big data can give you quite a good clue insights into this first um, straight away. In terms of thinking about the actual causality, whether something really causes something, some really sophisticated techniques, including techniques like machine learning, can start to help us here. So here is a study uh, that was performed. In fact, this was um, this this paper was put, written by um, some clinicians and data scientists working together in a datathon uh, that we hosted a couple of years ago online. Um, where we gave them access um, to the Amsterdam UMC database that I described earlier and asked them to um, solve certain problems that we, we set them. Now, this is a something called a reinforcement learning algorithm. This algorithm, which we borrowed from machine learning communities, is a kind of algorithm that people have used to try and teach computers to, for example, fly a model helicopter. And they'll use the data and try and explore within the data, well, if I do this, does it make a good outcome more or less likely. And that way the machine learning algorithm can develop its policy for how um, it, what the best um, best treatment uh, effect, uh, treatment policy should be. In this case, we were looking at um, the use of steroids in a critically ill patient. Now the randomized controlled trials, well, I've lost count of how many randomized controlled trials there are for steroid use in the intensive care unit. It's been going on since at least 2001. Most of them have been either negative or not particularly conclusive. But again, using this technique, a uh, really cutting edge state-of-the-art uh, machine learning algorithm, we can determine a better a policy for steroid usage, which in this in this case actually um, optimized um, survival and use rather less steroids than the human being policy, the human being's policy would have been. Machine learning can be about prediction as well. 
Um, this was a, a, a study that we did at CUH again. So this is CUH, essentially Erin database. Erin didn't exist in those days, but it would be Erin data uh, nowadays. Um, taking 2018 patients from October 2014 to 2016, the routinely collected data, and seeing whether or not there was anything anything about their discharge from intensive care that could have predicted their unexpected readmission. Because unexpected readmission is distressing. It's associated with longer lengths of stay and possibly more, even mortality. So it's something we'd really like to know about. So a few things to note about this. This was back in 2014. It's a relatively small number of patients. We have far few, far more patients that have gone through the intensive care unit since uh, we published this study. The performance of this wasn't brilliant. Um, the, the, a, we measure performance as something called an AUC, and the, the measurement was uh, 0.71. That isn't fantastic. But it hasn't really been bettered by anyone else still. So this is actually state-of-the-art kind of um, prediction algorithms. We can identify something about patients that will give us a clue as to whether they're going to bounce back. The other thing that's very interesting about this is that it's that, that I want to draw out is that here you can see the model was also trained on the MIMIC data. So and it, it had a rather le lower performance, 0.61. This is the data from America. And that's quite an interesting thing. So the model doesn't work. In, in predicting our patients when you've trained it on data from America. And that's because patients in America are very different to the intensive care patients that we see in this country, are different to patients that we see in the Netherlands and all around the world. In America, the intensive care patients tend to be far less sick than the patients in this country. We have fewer intensive care beds. So that's an important point. That if we want to understand healthcare, it's not enough to just say, well, we have an American data set. We have to use data sets that are local um, if we're going to understand, um, if we're going to understand uh, and improve our services. The last thing I want to say, which is in some ways a bit of a holy grail, and this is very prototype kind of data, so don't take this with a bit of a pinch of salt, but it is a real model uh, trained on the mimic data set, is this idea of an individualized treatment effect. So here I've got a patient, this is a, a, a particular, a single patient selected, not entirely at random from the MIMIC data set, where we've calculated, we've trained a model to calculate the probability of still being on a life support machine, still being on a ventilator, or being on a ventilator over time. You see, at the beginning, this patient doesn't have much, has a low probability of being on, on a ventilator, but over time, things happen to them and their, their probability, if we, if we didn't treat them, uh, goes up. In the individualized treatments effect models, what we're seeking to do is to put forward, counterfact make counterfactual predictions. So what would happen if we were to start antibiotics? And in this case, the counterfactual is that actually this patient would not end up on a ventilator, or that the, the probability would be lower over time if we were to give antibiotics. And we can try other kinds of counterfactuals as well. So in this case, we delay the antibiotics. We don't give the antibiotics until day three. And again, in this case, the probability of vent being ventilated goes up. So this is something you can do, but you require a huge, huge amount of data because you can imagine you need to require make a digital twin, a digital, um, a digital uh, counterpart to the, every single patient of, of interest, which is very, very difficult to do. So I'll leave it there. I'm very happy to take questions again at, at, at the end, um, but I just want to leave you on a thought, which is that actually one of the, the many problems that the NHS is facing at the moment, but one of our unique um, features of the NHS is that we are able, as a one big organisation, potentially to use data to Im really improve the health and care across our whole society in the UK. We're not subject to data being siloed by insurance companies and so on. We, we, we have, we have uh, this possibility. There are risks of to using observation data, but they're small and they can be controlled and they can be measured. So I'm just going to leave you with the question, is it even ethical not to try and use, make use of this unique resource for public good, when otherwise these data would essentially be lost and, and never looked at again? Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Ari, and really good to set the scene for introducing our final speaker for tonight. I'd like to welcome Dr. Raj Yena, who can share more examples of his experiences of using data to help uh, treat and save patients. Over to you, Raj. Thanks, Amanda. Um, I've decided to avoid the death by PowerPoint um, rule because it's so late in the evening. So I'm just going to talk to everyone. So thanks, everyone, for joining. 
and um, I hope we do stimulate a bit of interesting discussion. I always find the most interesting bits the Q&A rather than listening to uh, us blabber on. So just to introduce myself, um, so I, I work half, the t half uh, clinically and half in research, and I work in radiation oncology. Um, so radiotherapy, I believe, is very important. We use it about 50% of cancer patients will end up having some radiotherapy at some point in their cancer journey. And it's used in about 40% of patients that are cured of cancer. And I've been involved in radiotherapy research and sort of computation of various uh, um, uh, forms for about 20 years now. Now, my experience of innovation in a hospital, in like a hospital in the NHS, is a really simple thing. And that is, you start small with a very simple idea or concept that is brand new. You get it working, you establish a precedent, and then you work upwards and outwards from there. So I have a particular AI project that, that uh, I just tell you a, a little bit about over the next few minutes. And that's a very good example of that. Now it started in radiotherapy now, that's for two reasons. Firstly, because I work there, so it's kind of all good, always good to sort of work in your uh, research in your home turf. But secondly, because the radiotherapy department, when it comes to sort of data governance, is a bit of a walled garden in the hospital in terms of the way that it generates imaging. So what do I mean by that? Well, all of us, if we come to the emergency department, for example, and we've fallen off a bike or something and hurt ourselves, we're quite likely to generate some imaging as a result of that uh, particular um, uh, uh, interaction with the hospital. But in that particular imaging episode, it's done for a specific reason to make a diagnosis, have you broken a bone or not? And so we don't really go through the process of consent for research in that process. Now, in radiotherapy, by the time a patient gets to us and we start to generate images to actually plan a cancer therapy, we've got a fair ways down the line. We already have a diagnosis and we already know what we need to do for the patient, um, specifically if it's a curative treatment in order to achieve cure. So we've got a very different discussion with a patient when we discuss consent about the process of starting to have some images taken to plan that radiotherapy treatment. So we have more time, more experience, and more events have happened with that patient that help them to understand, okay, well, when I agree to have this scan, what is the added benefit for research at this point? And I think that's really important in terms of my own story of understanding how having that very facilitated mechanism for governance and consent has really helped us unblock some hurdles when we're trying to do something, albeit very innovative, but starting small. The other thing that we have is over the last 20 years, we've got a really great patient involvement panel of people often that have come through and had radiotherapy themselves or family members of people that have had radiotherapy treatment. And so it's meant that as we were sort of starting to build these ideas together and start to discuss consent, we also had the possibility of speaking to patients about how we do these things, how we actually shape the research in particular, and how we should best do the approach so that it makes sense for everybody that's involved. So about 10 years ago, I started working with some researchers in computer vision at Microsoft, and they had some interesting technology that seemed to be good at marking up parts of the human body so that you could identify regions. They developed it so that you could play a video game using parts of your anatomy. Uh, and then they'd suddenly realized, oh, hang on a minute, this might be useful for medical doctors. And we started working on this initially with some open data sets. You've heard Ari describing some of these and then gradually working towards some data sets that came from Cambridge originally for patients with brain tumors. And it worked so well, we, we won an international grand challenge where we were looking at building basically computerized tools to mark out, in this case, regions of a brain tumor better than anyone else in the lab. There were about 40 labs around the world competing. So this technology continued to develop about 2014, deep learning, a very powerful set of AI algorithms came together. And by 2016, we were starting to apply this to our data. Now, because we had a consent mechanism, we had a mechanism whereby we could take data 
from patients in our own hospital and actually plug it in in a safe way to the models that were built by Microsoft, but do it here in our department and actually try it out clinically, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. But it's just due to the nature of the clearance that we had and the fact that that data was so easily de-identified for this task because we weren't asking the, the algorithm to make a diagnosis or anything like that that required any other information about the scans. We were just literally asking it to go through the scans and mark up all of the healthy organs in that scan that it could see, all of the healthy anatomy, because that's something that takes us a long time when we're preparing radiotherapy treatment. So we plugged it in in 2018. First year and a half, it didn't work too well. But we were fortunate that because it was plugged in, we could talk to our clinicians and go through multiple cycles of improving the models. And then by about 2020, something interesting happened. It got so good that when we had to turn it off, my colleagues started complaining. They said, look, I know this is a research tool and we have to take these steps in order to be able to use the, 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 um, uh, the output of the machine learning model clinically but it's really useful and I miss it when it's turned off. So at this point in 2021, we decided that we would apply to NHS England for what's called an AI award. And the idea here was to take a technology that had already been proven, that for which we had some pilot data to show that it could work in a hospital, and to actually build a medical device using open source code. That's the other thing to mention is that all of the code behind this model was freely shared by Microsoft so that we could plug it into the hospital completely independently and basically build an open source AI imaging device from within the NHS uh, for the NHS. And essentially earlier this year, that's what we were able to do. We were able to complete a technical file and then hand that over to a manufacturer so that Addenbrooks became the designer of an AI powered medical device. And that means that in order to, in doing so, it makes it much easier for it to scale out from one radiotherapy in a big research active hospital like Addenbrooke's and scale it out to 65 other NHS radiotherapy centers that we have across the country. So that's a wonderful story, and it's an, but it's an enviable workflow. And the problem is, is that it doesn't scale. Even within our hospital, it doesn't scale. I'm the first to acknowledge that our little, my little walled garden in radiotherapy, where everyone has a consent discussion, and you can very clearly earmark what bits you want to do with radiotherapy, and we can build an NHS rec approved research database specifically around that consent model, that covers about 3% of all of the imaging data generated in the hospital each day. So for all the spots that my machine learning algorithm can perform in radiotherapy images, it's still really challenging to actually scale that up to my radiology colleagues who want to look at these things and say, well, can we use it to start drawing around other tumors, for example? Can we start to take these smarts and actually build it into a better diagnostic workflow so that it's actually helping in diagnosis as well as what we call quantitative radiology, which is the sort of more correct place where this particular machine learning algorithm fits because it's essentially marking out and measuring things rather than diagnosing things. So I think more than anything, this matters now in 2023, even more than it did in 2021 when we started the AI award. Because as an NHS hospital, we are now able to build these types of bleeding edge technologies within our walls. And that's largely because of the power of the cloud. We were very fortunate that our BRC recognized the value of the cloud and we had it plumbed into the hospital in the summer of 2020. It's the only reason we were able to go ahead with the AI award and that cloud computing effectively democratizes the kind of incredibly powerful computing that is available to industry, uh, commercial entities and everything the hospital can do the same. So if the hospital needs to spin up 1,000 of these incredibly powerful computers called graphics processing units, each of which costs £5,000 to buy, instead of forking out £5 million to run them for about 100 hours and then them sitting dormant, they just pay a few pounds an hour for the time that they need them. So that, to me, 
is why this evening matters and why Erin matters, because Erin is our best interpretation of the best practice of how we could reuse data safely in the context of not obtaining explicit consent in order to facilitate the type of innovation that I've tried to take in very baby steps and actually scale it upwards. We have seen what happens when there isn't an ERIN and a hospital goes into a collaboration with a commercial entity and the data sharing is too permissive and appropriate safeguards and guide rails are not put in place. And we've seen what happens when that can go wrong. So I'm really proud that we have something like Erin, because actually, if it had been available to me all the way back in 2016, I can't help but wonder whether I could have got to the same point in 2018, rather than getting there in 2023. Now, a final note I'd just like to share with you from this. This is a sort of good example of a final mile story where a hospital has been involved all the way from the very inception of a concept of, in this case, an AI uh, uh, algorithm, all the way through the full spectrum to taking out to market as a fully fledged medical device. OK, a large part of what the hospital's role in that was to build what's called a risk file. So this is part of the technical file that gets sent to whoever's going to act as a manufacturer for the device. And it basically, what you have to do is it's like what I call the Dr. Pepper question. If you remember the Dr. Pepper adverts, what's the worst thing that could happen? So we had to think of over 500 things that are simple uh, radiotherapy AI where something could go wrong. And we had to work out a mitigation against every single one of them. And we did, except for one, okay? And that was, what happens if the AI draws around something and it happens to be the target for radiation therapy and it's not checked by the oncologist and it's not checked by the physicist again either? Both incredibly unlikely things because most of my colleagues, what they will do is they will trust the AI to draw around healthy organs, but they wouldn't trust it to define the target because after all, that is the art of the radiotherapy treatment. That's where our skill comes in. But were that to happen in theory, and the algorithm were to make a mistake and miss part of the target, then of course that could result in harm to the patient. So when we had the discussion with uh, device regulators about this, we got to a really interesting point, and that's this. Some of the most innovative technologies that are out there, like robots for surgery and things like that, you can't absolve them of all risk. But it would be wrong to negate the value of that device simply because you didn't exclude that 499th, or in this case, actually it was the 500th risk. What matters is that the potential for patient benefit exceeds the risks in the operator's hands. And I think that's really important for what Ari's been talking about, you know, in terms of the power of big data. It, we all acknowledge that the tremendous power that's there to um, benefit uh, patients in ways that we might not even be able to uh, manage now. But it's that last bit in the operator's hands that I think is so important. So I'll stop there. Hopefully that's food for thought. And um, we're uh, happy to take up any questions when we come to the Q&A. Brilliant. Raj, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers who have set the scene perfectly for the Q&A session and the panel discussion that we're going to have now. Thank you also to all the members of the audience who have sent in some questions already and to those of you who are popping questions in the chat because I can see that we're already generating some fantastic discussion. So could I ask our four panelists to join us please? So three of our members you've already met tonight and then I'd also like to introduce Andy Bush who's one of our public members uh, who was very involved in research um, right across Cambridge and who has become um, very involved in health data research as well and will be weighing in from a sort of a, a public perspective. So gentlemen, thank you all of you for your excellent presentations already this evening and for setting the scene so well. I thought what we might start with is that, um, so there, I will say to the to the audience, we had um, something in the order of 60 or 70 questions sent in, which is absolutely fantastic. There was so much food for thought uh, as we sort of were having a chat around um, what we wanted this evening to do earlier, and we sort of grouped them into to different um, themes, because some of you had sort of quite similar questions. 
But one of the really strong questions that came through, perhaps by way of starting, is a bit of a question around the style or the size or the scale of this issue. So I've kind of conglomerated this into a question of a question for all of you of how important do we think health data research is as a field? And within that, how important are health data records particularly? So I know Raj and Ari, you've already alluded to this a little bit, so I will ask you to weigh in in a second. Adam, in terms of the volume of, of inquiries that you see, how much, how many applications would you say you see from researchers just in Cambridge? Uh, I guess it kind of varies. I, on average, we probably get five or six a month at our data access committee. Uh, so I guess we're talking sort of 65 to 70 a year, something in that kind of ballpark. Uh, so it's a fairly, I guess it is a fairly sort of large chunk of the overall research portfolio at CUH. Um, yeah, and I think it's probably going to grow as well. I mean, you know, as uh, data research becomes more democratised, as Raj was saying, I think the number of applications we get will only increase. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. And I, to my understanding, that's partly why Erin has been created is to help hopefully drive demand, but also to help us cope with it when sort of the influx, as it were, comes. Um, Andy, from a public perspective, I introduced you as being very involved in, in research in Cambridge. Among all the research that you see, how common, roughly, would you say health data projects are becoming? Well, I mean, absolutely huge. Um, so with my one of my other hats, which is Research Ethics Committee, we're seeing at least half of all our research applications are very much data driven. Um, and of course, AI is the is the common theme. But as uh, Raj says, there's a huge amount of cap capacity, capability there. But without the data, it's just it's useless. It's a, like a tool without the, you know, the, with about the bits. Um, so every aspect, I think we're seeing the need to get access to good quality data and large amounts of it in the easiest way possible. Uh, and and we talked a bit earlier about consent being a perhaps a barrier sometimes to actually getting access to that. So what we spend a lot of our time doing in ethics uh, is trying to enable consent um, in all, every way that you can. Sometimes you have informed consent. Sometimes you have to do it through proxy. But uh, getting a safe a safe way to get access to data, make sure that the data is fully anonymized if it hasn't got full consent from the uh, individual, even if it has, you need uh, usually to anonymize that data and then make that available in a secure way. And we've seen with the data breaches, this is a, such a multi multi-factual issue because mo more and more data available to more and more people is more and more risk potentially. So uh, again, luckily my background, sorry, my video keeps going on and off. So I'll, as long as you can hear me, uh, can that's, that's a better picture than me anyway than my dark office. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, no, so look at all the data breaches we're hitting at the moment. And then one of the questions I saw uh, online there was, you know, we've had the police force and we've had all, all these, everybody's, uh, and Manchester University in particular, from the research, uh, research perspective, was hit really hard with a data breach. So we're juggling the giving access to data, uh, making data available in, in the, the maximum number of ways in a, in a secure uh, way of, of doing that. And, and that's quite a, quite a challenge, really, because... Yeah. I have to say, and I'll say this very carefully because I don't work for the NHS, they've never really been the best IT people in uh, in my experience. I've got 40 odd years in IT, worked in a lot of NHS projects, uh, and they've, they've never really potentially had, you know, maybe it's resources. They haven't had the best resources available to them. So uh, I think it's a bit of an extra challenge there that they do that. But uh, and I'll, I'll finish on this part, but there's some really good initiatives like the uh, trusted research, research environments, which help that happen. And another question I saw was posted in the uh, in the questions was about duplicating data. So mm -hmm. making data available and keep making it available and then copying it around is when insecure. And secondly, is duplicating it to make it a, 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 is a different trusted research environments uh, do offer a bit of a safe harbor to make mm -hmm. large amounts available in a secure way to researchers where they don't have to take it off and do something with it, which is usually the biggest uh, security error. So, uh, sorry, I rambled around the question a bit there. Is that-, um, so, is that I just okay? don't want you to steal the thunder from the discussion later on, because that's definitely one of the, the points that we want to touch on. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Andy. Um, and actually, it does really lead into the next most common question by a country mile can best be summed up as how safe is our data. So Ari and Adam, I might start with you uh, on that. Adam, do you want to weigh in and then Ari? Yep, sure. So um, 
so one of the main things we look at through the data access committee is the arrangements for security so we have to be assured that the data is going to be stored securely with restricted access to named researchers that are named to us um, and we wouldn't release data if we weren't assured of the security um, of course if the data is staying inside the nhs then that is much more uh, kind of reassuring it's staying in an environment where it's stored anyway um, but yeah, we wouldn't really stay trying this we were assured of the security and we have we're very lucky to have technical experts like Andy and Raj and Ari sit on that committee that know far more about the technical side of data security than I'm able to speak to. Brilliant thanks Alan. Ari do you want to weigh in on top of that? Yeah yeah absolutely so I mean so this is this is the crux of it isn't it okay and and, and it is impossible to completely guarantee that something cannot be re-identified that, that's it just that is not possible and but i think we have to think a little bit about what, what does that mean okay what, what is it that we mean by re-identification what i mean by that is that a load of data healthcare data that might be you know your blood tests and your, your sodium tests in your in your blood or, or something like that things that are actually not terribly exciting could be linked to a, a named person using some information that is available out there that the person who has the data might have. And I've given one example earlier with the, with the, the, the Michael Schumacher, um, but not, not that there was a data breach, but just, just as a sort of to, to illustrate that. Now, you know, what's the risk of that? Well, in an intensive care unit, the risk is that you might know that someone's um, you know, got an antibiotic or something. It's probably not even an enormous risk, but we, we don't want that to happen. But most patients, by the fact that the data is very, very large, there is a certain anonymity guaranteed by the fact that we have lots of patients, some look more similar to each other, and therefore you can't tell whether it's this one or that one, and therefore you, you can't, it's difficult to re-identify. We, so we do, and, it, and as I showed you earlier, and, and that Amsterdam EMC paper is actually quite a nice example, it's possible to put some sort of statistical estimate, guesstimates to what that possible chances of re-identification are, and it's context sensitive. So for the average public and I put researchers as members of the public because we don't have access to social security data and other things as well right so for the average member of the public that risk of re-identification re is really small and we can and we can group data together say so, well actually there's only one 100 year old in this data set well we can say okay well we'll make sure that we we aggregate 80 to 100 year olds so that actually it doesn't sort of... now there is a trade-off that because the more we aggregate things the less useful the data is. And in the end result, we aggregate it completely and just give, well, this is the number of patients we got. And that's not individual record level data. We lose the utility. So there is always a trade-off between how we how far we anonymize, and how, how deeply we aggregate things to make people completely un, un, um, re-identifiable and the utility of the data. And we will always consider how de-identified does this need to be so that the research project is possible and it, it should, um, um, so the other part to it is actually we don't release data to anyone to then sublet and sub and, uh, and move on to other people so for example what would be a disaster is, is we what would be bad is if we were to give some data to somebody and they gave it to somebody else and they gave it to their friend and their friend gave it to someone else and then end up with the insurance company actually the insurance company we have got other data and they can re-identify so we don't allow that so all the data is released um, quite rightly on an individual project basis for a particular project uh, and they're not and people are not allowed to use it for anything else and i would just last lastly say is that trying to re-identify data that has been identified is not it's it's not just against the law it is actually a criminal offense so um, I don't particularly want to lose my license to practice and end up in, in jail. You know, I think there is quite a, there's a very severe penalty for people that actually try and do this for bad actors that will try and try and do that. And that actually goes for industry as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's a very long. I could talk for hours about how we actually do it. Um, papers are there, but it, it is it, it, we think about it very hard. Mm. I think just to add to that as well, like I guess there are always trade offs, um, and we are absolutely trying to strike a balance between protecting privacy and facilitating research. But it is very possible to strike that balance, I think. You know, like privacy and research are not kind of opposites, right? It's possible to sit in the middle. Um, and when we do review applications, we're always kind of thinking about the content of the data and the context in which it's then accessed and stored and analyzed. So 
and striking a balance between the content and the data and the context is also kind of key to preserving privacy, right? So if it's stored in the NHS and accessible to clinicians who would access it anyway, then that's a very controlled context. Um, and therefore you need to kind of come down less hard on the content potentially. Um, and I think to also to speak to Ari's point around, so I guess all medical data is sensitive data, but that doesn't mean it's all equally sensitive, right? So if there is a risk of re-identification and then there's also the kind of, we have to think about what happens if a patient is re-identified. So if a patient is re-identified and someone has access to their blood pressure readings, that's potentially not that exciting. If the patient is re-identified and there's a, their access to very sensitive data around domestic circumstances and that kind of information, that's a real risk of disclosure. So those are all the kind of things that we would think about when we're reviewing applications and we're always trying to like Ari said, facilitate research whilst maintaining patient privacy. I think also for the involvement hat, that's very much this this balance of risks and trade-offs is very much where we currently see our conversations happening. And it's so helpful to have some of these real world discussions to be able to look at, well, if this, then that, and if we don't do this, then that is some of the outcome. So certainly to everyone in the audience, these are very much the types of discussions I was going to say that excite people like myself and my colleagues. Excite might be the wrong phrase, but that we're really interested in getting uh, into with members of the public and that we involve people like Andy and as part of our patient panels um, and things like that. I think the other thing that I've seen, sorry, Andy, I'll come just to you in a second, is that as, as they've, uh, everyone's taken a lot of pains to try and explain to me how all this sort of works and safety is very much done on a layered basis. So there's no single tool, there's no single lock that we use to keep the data safe. There are these layers of different ways of, of taking care of, of data and making sure that we use it safely and correctly and that those are used together. Um, Andy, I know you're even better at explaining some of yeah, these. Yeah, no, it's a real good point about layering da uh, data as security. If you look at the, the big big public security breaches of public data at the moment, uh, it's, it's pretty much all human error that's done this. It's people sending files with stuff in. It's leaving laptops on trains. It's memory sticks. It's all that, really. That That's a big, huge issue that we fight off when we're looking at research applications. Do you really need to put it on a laptop? Do you really need to take you, you know, that sort of stuff? And so you can get rid of that as a layer quite quite quickly because mostly you don't need to do it. It's usually just com more convenient for somebody to to, to do that. Um, so take, take away those errors. And, and I think you are right, you know, although I... Don't say bad things about the NHS uh, IT capability, but actually keep the data within inside the, the walls is a great, great security um, um, uh, approach. Um, and uh, certainly Spine and various other uh, NHS uh, uh, secure environments are, are, are really pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's usually people not thinking. Um, it's, um, as I said, sending data without thinking about it and not realizing they've done it so don't give them the capability to do it and that gets rid of half half of the problems but don't stop and i see a lot of these i'm really really want to encourage the use of the data if we can in the most secure way i'm very much an advocate uh, for making more data available and it's just a real shame when sometimes certain organizations sorry certain parts of maybe the government or whatever uh, just do stupid things like they did with the the big data grab for and uh, for primary care data. Let's, let's just give everybody access to primary care data, and and they didn't realise actually a lot of people out there are really quite intelligent and realise that that's not a good idea in the way they were proposing to do it, and that could have really opened the floodgates and that were too late to be closed. Um, uh, that so there are good people out there. That are, I guess keeping an eye on this, and I think we ought to be vigilant to make sure that we're not protecting our own areas, but looking on a broader scale about how data is being shared um, yeah. and uh, by perhaps the government not making the best decisions. Learning from those earlier experiences. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, Amanda, to come to your point about, you know, this the, this this public engagement, I think, you know, it is really, really great. We did this in Amsterdam and, you know, asked people, so this is the risk, these are, and I explained to people, so is this an acceptable risk, is it not? Let, let's calibrate what we, what, what we and I'm part of society as well feel is an acceptable risk, and you know the Netherlands is different to the UK. We 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 need to have repeat this. We really need to repeat this these kinds of these kinds of dialogues so we can understand what is what is and is not acceptable. Um, and and I think yeah to Andy's point, I think it's really sad when it only takes one one person to sort of mess it up. Um, we do have to be really really careful. We have to treat tread tre tre extremely carefully. Um, uh, and yeah, the 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 NHS digital 
um, experience. A lot of people opted out, and, you know, sort of a number of percent of the whole population opted out as a result of not feeling that their data was going to be dealt, treated with the respect that it, it deserved. And whether or not that was right or, or not, that, that's hugely damaging for the enterprise of, of, of doing research. And it creates this you know, biased, biased population and so on. And we will never get these people back, I shouldn't think. You know, um, and, and it's a real wasted or lost opportunity. So um, no, absolutely commend it. Actually, we had a few questions that kind of came along this sort of similar thread. Um, Adam, you have alluded to some of this, and I know um, Raj and Ari, you probably experienced some of it. One of the questions, or several of the questions, were around the speed with which researchers can access data for uh, whether or not they feel it's fast or, or slow. Um, I don't mean to keep picking on you, Adam, but you, do you want to start just weighing in on how we balance kind of this safety and the ability to get research out? Yeah, um, so so our data access committee meets once a month. Um, the patient panel that we're setting up will sort of hopefully slot in alongside that, so kind of be monthly as well. Um, so in that sense, if an application is uh, sort of treading a well-trodden path, then I don't think it would take a long time to approve data access. Uh, the bit that comes after about actually giving access to the data it's kind of a separate part, right? But um, in terms of the governance piece that I oversee, um, I don't think that should take a long time. If I guess kind of by the nature of research, you're always trying to do something new. So if that new in for a particular application happens to be new types of data, new ways of storing it, new, you know, whatever it might be, then that might take longer to review because we may have more questions and more governance issues to come back to you with. Um, but the whole point of the own database, or one of the main points at least, is to facilitate research in a more streamlined way. So the process that we've had for the last couple of years has, uh, I guess from my perspective, been relatively streamlined, but for researchers perhaps not. Um, so yeah, the own database, one of the main aims is to streamline research applications and make it quicker, but still keep the robustness and still ensure that we're protecting privacy. No doubt. Yeah. Sort of matures will get better and better and it will also get faster. Ari, did you want to come in as well? Yeah, uh, so I would say it, it, it um, far, far quicker than getting a randomised control trial uh, or study off the ground. Um, uh, far, far quicker than going through a full requiring, uh, something that requires a full ethical approval process. Um, although that, you know, again, if it's well trodden, that isn't too, isn't too bad. Um, so I think it is pretty streamlined. Just to touch on that, on Anna's point about actually getting access to the data, the um, database that, so that the, the the electronic health record that we have at CUH covers absolutely everything that ever happens in CUH. Pretty much, we're, we're, we're pretty much paperless. Um, and you could imagine that the database that underpins the electronic health record is um, very large and extremely complicated because everything is recorded in it. So it is not a trivial matter um, from a data science point of view to go in and just extract certain things. So there's quite a lot of data engineering that has to happen in terms of translating someone's query into this is actually where those data elements are uh, within within the database. That's not a tr trivial thing and, um, and that can cause some delays, but um, difficult to know how to get around that really. Yeah. And uh, Raj, I know you've had lots of experience in this area. Would you say it's getting better? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to... I'd like you to consider this from the other perspective, namely that of the really young and very, very innovative researcher, okay? And six months is the thing to hold on to. I was very lucky a few years ago to go to one of the world's leading machine learning conferences. And the vast majority of people who were going there were working on video gaming, financial technology, and insurance. And those of us that were interested in healthcare represented about one in 10 of the researchers there. In Cambridge, we have some of the finest, finest minds in mathematics and engineering and computer science. And when one of them comes up and says, do you know what, I'm motivated for whatever the reason, sometimes it's a deeply personal one, to find a more altruistic way to use my knowledge of machine learning, it's wonderful. The thing that is so dis disturbing is when I say to them, that's great, but let's talk again in six months when the governance is ready. 
because six months is often as long as they have to work on the project. So something like Erin, that's where it can really accelerate because if we can say, do you know what? Let's assume that we've got some data sets there that already fit and we have some domain knowledge of a clinical problem that we could address. That's the bit we can do really well as engaged clinicians. But if the governance layer can then move forward so that you can release data to that researcher in six weeks, then all of these foundling concepts, all of these great ideas that are nascent within Cambridge suddenly become possible. And I, I shudder to think of the number of bright students that I came across who actually, sadly, they just they said, look, I'm going to go off and work in robotics or uh, video gaming and things like that, because although they were passionate about healthcare, from their own career trajectory, they couldn't afford to wait. Andy, do you want to? Yeah, just a quick, quick one on the back of both of those, though. This subject changed slightly. And also one of the questions online about trying to make uh, research more successful. And this goes back to, I guess, Ari's point about trying to get the size of, of, of uh, double blind trials and things going. I think one of the things uh, research ethics can do, because it's not really about just the ethics, it's about quality. Um, uh, and one of the things I think research ethics can do, and it's a shame sometimes that a research application gets as far as an ethics uh, committee, uh, and is quite poor in its quality um, and therefore reviewing the quality of the application from the perspective of all the things we just discussed, the security, the uh, anonymization, uh, the statistical analysis. Luckily, we have some really good people on the committee who are statisticians. Uh, and you need those guys because I don't know how to power uh, a research application in the number of uh, candidates you need for that. So I think that getting the quality right uh, makes the, the chances of the research more successful much higher. And I think what's happened, I've seen the last, I've been on the Research Ethics Committee for six years now, I think, and I've been on your, your committee, Amanda, for about eight, um, is the quality of the um, the questioning of the research is better. It, it's, I hate to say it, it's a process thing, but nobody likes process, but they, you know, you have to go through a process to answer all of these questions, and then the questions feed more, more questions. And that's got better and better and better. So actually, it's, it's much more difficult to come up with a bad application, because usually you've been asked those questions, uh, and you had to answer them, hopefully, in a, in a way that actually means your research is, has been thought about. It's, it's again, it goes back to the, the point said before there, if you have to think about the 500th um, you know, reason that this might go wrong, that's brilliant if you've got that far, because we do we do balance risk in that. We, we, you can't be in a totally safe playground and let your kids not graze their knees. And we're very pragmatic about research to say, yes, it's got to be safe. We've got to, we've got to protect the patient, protect all these things. But actually, you've got to give a bit of a lead uh, to, to ex experiment. Uh, try new innovative things because if you do that we'll never progress so we, we try and do that do that balance yeah and I think I mean no one gets excited about process I think when we start talking about process and data but it is the really fundamental important thing that can help researchers and members of the public get excited about the rest of it if we can get this right and that's very much what the Erin database is about and very much why we want to bring members of the public in. Now, I keep having one eye, one eye on the time because I know everyone's probably quite keen to go and have their dinner. We've kind of got two um, main areas of questioning left. One that I want to touch on just briefly because it's really important and then we'll get into how can people help us because that's the next big area. But Ari, I know you touched on this briefly in, in your talk and Raj, I think you mentioned it too. Another really important question that people uh, have asked us quite a bit is around how health data can help or exacerbate health inequalities and how it might impact some groups more than others. And although this is a whole area that we could have a whole talk on, I did just want to bring you in, in quickly. So Ari, I might start with you um, and then come to Raj and, and, and yeah. at the end. Yeah, there was a, a, something in the Q&A actually that I was just posting. Um, so health inequalities are clearly a big deal. And I think having access to big data actually allows us to go and start to drill in and identify where there is areas of need. Are there areas of, of society that are not, not receiving the kinds of care or differences in care, variances in care and so on? So I think there's a huge possibilities there. Um, and I would go as far as say, I think it's essential, right? I mean, I think, you know, we are we are an older society. We are facing more and more stresses on the NHS, more and more increasing, increasing costs. So, you know, we need to start being targeted about things and actually make sure that we're doing the same thing, the right things for everybody. 
I think there are some areas, okay? So there was a question in the Q&A about you know, AI and health inequalities. And I think you know, the AI algorithms, and actually it's not just AI, you know, even statistical algorithms, right? They're only as good as what you train them on. And so if you train them on the wrong, they, they can be, they can have biases, their own biases, right? They can, they, they can be subject to biases. So it is really important that any algorithm or any process that comes out of big data is, is validated as being trustworthy. Um, I mean, there are lots of minutiae that go into that, but just to say that it's it's very, very well appreciated. There are huge numbers of guidelines, what we call guidelines, we think of a little shake stick at that have been, that have been published to think about. These are the things you need to think about if you're going to actually validate your algorithm, your process, or whatever it is, to make sure that it actually is a fair and trustworthy, trustworthy process. Fantastic. Raj, did you want to come in on that at all from sort of your perspective with the radiotherapy and things? Yeah, just just briefly, you know, Ari highlighted the issues that these machine learning algorithms in particular, because of their propensity for overfitting to the data you feed them, are hugely bias prone. And look, my feeling is, is that the strongest motivator for moving to a framework whereby you can share de-identified patient data without consent is actually one around social inequality. Because we know that in our data sets, it's the a particular demographic of patients who are A, going to get themselves to hospital and come for tests that allow them to have the very best curative radiotherapy treatments because their cancer has been caught early. And those patients who are going to stay at home and avoid healthcare, they're going to have worse outcomes and may not get treatment and therefore not be representative in the hospital-based data sets. And that's just one very, very trivial example from my area. So I think, you know, this really plays into the question. Of, and I think, you know, the, the single most powerful factor for me from the design phase of removing the consent hurdle is actually is that it it will actually address data inequality uh, and how that actually works at the point at which it's collected and i think as we scale out and we increasingly move to things like secure data environments so that we're actually aggregating data safely from multiple hospitals or in the primary care setting then it starts to get really really interesting Fantastic. And Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, no, Raj just raised a really good point. I hadn't really thought this through. Again, one of the big battles we have with all the research applications is to make sure that there is equality and inclusivity in them. Uh, almost not everyone, a large majority of them just don't think about it really. Or they, they want, to, I hate to say, an easy life. They don't translate patient information sheets into other languages apart from English. They exclude their exclusion criteria, exclude everybody apart from white English. And all these bizarre things you think in the 21st century we would have got past, but they don't. So we, 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 we've almost rejected applications to say, go back and get your recruitment uh, policies better, because actually this will produce bad data, bad research. Uh, you'll, we've seen this, you know, you, the, the clinicians here uh, saw this 20 years ago when in America uh, they they chose only white males for testing certain drugs because they thought, uh, well, it'll work on females, won't it? Because they're sort of just the same. Uh, not quite as crude as that, but that was the case. So, but the, now with with, with the different different uh, ethnicities having totally different, uh, um, um, I guess, responses to certain drugs and, and other regime, uh, you have to have a, a very very, and it's so so difficult. Uh, to to recruit into that and perhaps if we can get access to that data as, as Raj said through those, that data being already available rather than trying to go out there and recruit people from different socio-economic groups or different ethnic groups that might help but we have to work much much harder at getting the, the researchers to recruit across the board uh, and that's 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 something we beat the drum every single every single month. Exactly. Ari, did you want to come in quickly? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I was, and I was just going to just reflect on, you know, I gave that example of the, the, the cardiac arrest and we showed that socioeconomic status was a determinant of not receiving bystander CPR. And we weren't looking for that. That just emerged from the data. But it's really interesting. How did we get the socioeconomic status? So the socioeconomic status emerged from knowing some aspect of the postcode of where the... And their postcodes start to become quite sensitive, don't they? So again, I think it's a really nice demonstration that you can get some really interesting insights out, but there's always this trade-off between what's safe and what isn't safe and what's personal. I think there's a whole event that we could and should do around trade-offs. And I think just as a final reflection from me around 
one of the purposes of having the um, patients and members of the public on the air and database is to help us as researchers take note of these things to check whether or not there are obvious impacts on inequalities and things like that. So with my comms hat on, often what we do at the end of events is we do something, what we call the call to action. And I think the last two questions really fall into this. We have to group them together. We have had several healthcare professionals, um, clinicians, nurses, uh, all sorts who have asked us what they can do to get involved to help support data research. And of course, perhaps most obviously, but usefully of all, we've had several patients and members of the public ask what they can do to help um, to, to push this forward. So I'm going to um, hand the sort of clinician healthcare professional question to, to Raj and Ari, and then perhaps Adam and Andy want to finish on what patients can do. So Raj, Ari, do one of you want to tackle the what healthcare professionals can do first? Um, shall I have a go? I mean, I, I think the first thing is for all of us to realise that we've all got data scientists inside us. And actually, it's just about talking to patients about the data that you're aware of with their interaction. And if we create the environment where basically everyone, even, you know, even the person that's just, you know, welcomed you into clinic kind of thing uh, and, and checked, you know, that you're in the right place and at the right time to meet the, 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 the clinical team that you're seeing kind of thing. You know, I think that's a really big thing we can do. And a second thing I think is, is that, a lot of the really good AI tools, they're shared openly by the community, which is hugely democratizing. And it always really makes my heart sing when I see something that's led not by a consultant and where you actually have a really good, and it might be, you know, it may not be using cutting edge AI, it may be using more standard statistical analysis, but it is so nice when somebody in my department has said, I have observed this. And I would like to collect the data to see if I'm right or wrong. And I think having those little, tiny little conversations in the corridor with each other, with patients, that's what we need to do so that this just becomes like a normal thing. I, I agree. So and to pick up on that last point about the, the, the tools and things, I think one of the wonderful things about data science is um, that it's really cheap, actually, once you've, got, once you've got the data. So all the tools, the packages and things, it is all open source. Now, they're not, all, there is a learning curve, right? Uh, and not everyone wants to be a data scientist. And that's why somebody might want to partner up with someone that is, you know, you know data kind of savvy. But actually, the, the tools are out there and, and, and you can learn how to do these things. Actually, not too difficult. The data thons that we've been running in intensive care have been incredibly effective at, at producing you know, multiple peer reviewed publications now over a few years. Um, so I think that's I think that's that's one thing. The other thing I would say I think for for clinicians just on a day to day basis, and this comes back to my sort of CCIO role, is that when things go wrong in in hospitals or in care, it's usually because the wrong person or such and such a person didn't have the right information at the right time to get make the right decision. For them. And so I would really urge from a clinical point of view that people have a real interest in data quality and actually entering decent quality data, but quite separately from any research because actually decisions that we make and downstream things um, uh, rely on that, on, 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 on these data. But a flip side of entering really high quality data is that we'll have high quality data to, to, to derive insights from as well. So it's another double a bonus as well for, for, for clinicians. Excellent. And then finally, and most importantly, having invited members of the public along to this event, Adam, from your perspective, what what how can people help you? What would you like people to do? Uh, so it would be fantastic to have as many people as possible join our patient panel. So we don't have an upper limit. So if all 53 people attending want to join, that would be fantastic, um, including us six, I think. So <laughs> yeah, so the contact details will come up at the end of the webinar. Um, that goes through to me and my team. So we'll be able to field any queries. We can send you more information. Uh, we want to work out the kind of logistics of how it will work in conjunction with the panel rather than me sort of deciding for you. Um, so other than a general interest, there isn't sort of anything required at this point other than a register of general interest. We'll have a meeting and decide how we want to work as a panel. Um, and hopefully we'll have many people attending that meeting and many people on the panel. And we'll share the details of how to do that um, before we finish. So Andy, giving you the last word as a member of the public, what would you say to encourage people to get involved? Oh, it, it's just, uh, well, from my perspective, it's just been so enjoyable um, getting this deeply involved in things you would never, ever be able to touch. Uh, from my perspective of being an IT guy, 
uh, and getting so deeply involved in medical research and seeing how exciting it all is. Um, I, you know, I enthuse to everybody else, everybody I meet saying you must get involved. There are so many ways of doing it. PPIs with your uh, panel I got involved in, and that spun me into the research ethics and then onto data with Adams and others. And then I, I became a healthy volunteer in so many trials myself. I had my brain scanned every which way, but loose in seven Tesla MRI scanners and you name it, then my knee. It's just a, a great thing to, 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 uh, I mean, it's what we're all about. We're, we're moving into a, an unhealthy society uh, just because of aging, I think, and understanding that they need more help and more volunteers to help them with that. And yet, you know, so I, I, I'll, I'll evangelize to anybody if you just, uh, you know, stick me in front of them. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much to all of our panellists and thank you to all members of the public who have stuck with us through various IT problems. As far as we're concerned, this is very much the start of the conversation. So we hope that you will get in touch. We hope that you will stay involved and that you will get involved and stay involved as Andy has. And we hope to see you at future events. Um, as you leave tonight's session, when you close the window, a little survey will pop up that will ask you some questions about tonight. If you do have a few minutes, we'd really appreciate it uh, if you could pop that in. And otherwise, it just leaves me to say thank you, everyone, very much for joining. And we look forward to seeing you at another discussion too. So thank you and good evening.